based on the emerging markets of Asia, Latin America, and Eastern Europe. Uh, let me uh, say a few things about the emerging markets before we ask our uh, 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 dean to introduce uh, two speakers from Texas A&M and, and uh, uh, Texpress. Emerging markets. In the last uh, five years, these countries are booming in terms of their stock exchanges, in terms of consumers, overall economic development. But since 1994, some of the markets are submerging. And the reason is because pesos, Mexico's peso crisis. So some of these markets went down, but overall in international business, most of these markets in the long term will stand a pretty good chance. So some of these markets we are now calling, they are re-emerging. So first they were emerging, then they were submerging, and now they are re-emerging. So basically uh, we have two speakers, Dr. Julian Gatsman from Texas A&M College Station and Mr. Jimmy Weicker. Uh, they will talk about these emerging markets. These two experts have traveled to those countries and they uh, have done uh, pretty good work. Uh, uh, tech Spray is from our uh, area, uh, Amarillo, and uh, it's a $20 million company. And Dr. Casper is uh, a Director Center for International Business Studies. But at this time, I would like uh, Dr. Jerry Miller to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Dr. Anmore. Um, Julian Gasper does for A&M what um, Dr. Anmore does for WT. He's responsible for internationalizing the curriculum, and uh, I think that Dr. Anwar has done a tremendous amount to internationalize not only our curriculum, but our community. And so that's what I'm especially proud of. Uh, Dr. Gaspar has worked for the International Finance Corporation, also for the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which is a division of the World Bank. He uh, has a PhD from the International um, uh, PhD in International and Monetary Economics from Georgetown University in Washington D.C. and it's one of the top international institutions that we have. Uh, so we're extremely proud to have him. He's going to address the macroeconomic environment. And then we have one of our own people, uh, James Witcher, who is marketing manager for TechSpray, and he has a degree from West Texas A&M. Uh, unfortunately, it's in uh, science. And it's, not, it's not unfortunate, but it's in chemistry. Uh, but he took three courses. I looked up his uh, record in computing. And so we're going to award him an honorary uh, degree in business. So he's, he's now uh, one of us. Um, he's going to speak uh, more specifically about uh, their uh, sort of micro environment that they operate in in foreign markets. So, uh, so we'll start with Dr. Gaspar. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you, Saeed, uh, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. This is my first time here in Canyon, and it really looks pretty, although it's pretty flat when I landed here. <laughs> I thought College Station was flat enough, but I think this is really flat. Uh, it's really interesting uh, times for us uh, as far as international business is concerned. What I propose to do today, uh, make a presentation of about uh, 20 minutes, I'll go over what emerging markets are and give you a feel for emerging markets, uh, the characteristics of emerging markets, and also the recent economic reforms uh, which have been implemented or being implemented in these emerging markets. And finally, for people in business, to give, to give you an idea of the sectoral opportunities in emerging markets. Uh, Emerging, uh, and if there's any questions, I'll make it pretty informal, so if you have any uh, questions as I go, maybe this is because of my sort of background, I guess, please interrupt if you can't understand or can't hear me. Okay. Um, first, what are emerging markets? Well, emerging markets are basically economies uh, that are moving to the free market system. Economies that were in the past and are following uh, command economic systems like the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe or highly social, uh, socialist economic systems. 
All of these economies that are moving to a free market system are called emerging markets. And uh, if you look at the political side too, you'll find that most of these emerging markets are moving towards uh, democratic political systems. Although there are a few which still continue to practice communism, especially in China. Uh, having said that, let me uh, give you an idea of uh, which these, uh, who these emerging markets are. And uh, I hope you, I hope you could see this. Uh, I know whether it's clear or not, but uh, there are different definitions for emerging markets, and I have chosen the definition which is used by the U.S. Department of Commerce. The U.S. Department of Commerce in Washington, D.C. did a major study last year to identify, at the request of uh, President Clinton, to identify markets for American producers or American manufacturers. And so they looked at the emerging markets uh, for the first time and identified these groups of countries as emerging markets. Uh, one way to look at uh, emerging markets is to look at the GDP, that is the output of goods and services in an economy, and also look at the population because these things give, from a marketing, marketing standpoint, the potential for U.S. goods, services, and investment. So if you look at the first group, uh, of course I put the United States on top to give you an indication of the size of our economy in terms of GDP, $6 trillion and our population approximately 261 million and our GDP per capita divided one by the other is 23 approximately 23,000 US dollars and our exports to the world uh, is about 502 billion this was 1994 figures and our exports of services that is like uh, airline services shipping banking consulting all those kind of services was 195 billion dollars so it's really huge, and of course you all know that the U.S. economy is the largest economy in the world, second is Japan. Uh, now when you look at the emerging markets, uh, in East Asia, uh, the countries are China with a GDP of $508 billion and a population of almost $1.2 billion, uh, and you have a GDP per capita of 425. So the China market is huge in terms of population, and GDP is not too bad, but in, in terms of per capita, it's 425. And that's very important because uh, per capita income gives you an idea of what the Jap I mean the Chinese can purchase, how much they could purchase. In terms of population, it's huge, but in terms of purchasing power, it's not all that great. So it depends when you think of marketing to a country like China, you've got to figure out what exactly you're trying to market. And uh, U.S. exports to China was only about $9 billion, that's $9.287 billion. Next is Hong Kong, uh, the most free market, uh, the, the, uh, I would say the most free market system in the world is in Hong Kong. Hong Kong's market, I mean, economy is more free than even the U.S. economy, okay? The market system there really operates. And a population of 6 million, and you have a per capita income of approximately 21,000, 22,000 US dollars. And their imports, you can see Hong Kong's imports from the United States is 11 billion. It's much greater than what China imports from us. Okay? So Hong Kong does import a lot from the United States. Then we have Taiwan and uh, South Korea. Okay? So these are the countries of East Asia which are so-called emerging markets. And uh, then we move to the ASEAN countries. ASEAN stands for the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And it comprises basically of six countries. I've omitted one, which is Brunei. Brunei is a tiny area within, uh, it's surrounded by Malaysia, has a population of 200,000 and a per capita income of 26,000 US dollars. It's an economy based on oil. Uh, the largest employer uh, is uh, Shell. Uh, and uh, it's not a diversified economy, and really it's not an emerging market, it's a small market, but part of the ASEAN group. So I've deleted that. Uh, but the big markets out there in, uh, in the ASEAN group is obviously Indonesia. Indonesia has a population of 175 million, 
and uh, I mean, I'm sorry, population of 192 million and uh, GDP of 195. As a country of 13,000, it has 13,000 islands. Depending upon the tide, you might have more. Okay? <laughs> so uh, if you want to own an island, go to Indonesia. It's, uh, very, it's very rich in natural resources, uh, gold, oil, gas, you name it, they have it. And tremendous potential. Malaysia, again, a dynamic economy, with a relatively small population, but uh, a lot of resources. Uh, Philippines, of course, Singapore, a very interesting country. Uh, only resources that Singapore has is human resources, but it's a completely or totally managed economy. Uh, managed, but still at the same time, we have uh, market forces operating, uh, tremendous incentives offered to foreign investment. And uh, so it's a very dynamic uh, economy. I don't know how many of you have been to Singapore, but you must have heard about Singapore because of the caning incident, but uh, there's more to Singapore than caning, okay? Uh, it's a very dynamic economy. Uh, there are certain limitations uh, I see over in the horizon, but uh, Singapore's per capita income is about the same as ours in the United States. But uh, it's a small island economy. Thailand, again, a very dynamic uh, country. So tremendous potential in terms of what they could purchase from us. In South Asia, India, country with a GDP of 278 and a population of close to a billion. So tremendous competition between India and China, I can see that. Uh, in Africa, the emerging market is South Africa. South Africa's GDP out of total Africa's GDP is about 45%. So it's really dominant. So South Africa, is really a dominant economy in Africa. And to an extent, uh, to an extent it's the engine of growth for Sub-Sahara Africa. In Europe, uh, Poland and Turkey, uh, we are talking about Eastern Europe. Maybe you could include, others would include Hungary, for example, uh, which could be included as an emerging market. But there again, uh, the same holds. Uh, Latin America, the three major emerging markets, are Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico. And all of us are very familiar with Mexico. And as uh, Syed mentioned earlier, sometimes these emerging markets submerge. But uh, that is because of some policies which are not properly followed through. Uh, that will be some other time. If you want me to come next time to talk about Mexico, I can talk to you for hours on Mexico. So these are the uh, big emerging markets as defined by the US Department of Commerce. Now next. What I'd like to do is to go over some of the common characteristics of the emerging markets. Okay, what are the common characteristics? All these economies, as I mentioned earlier, have taken market oriented forms. So that's one thing in common. That is, they have given up the command economic systems, they found that it has failed, and so they're moving towards free market systems. So that is a sort of a common theme among all the emerging markets. And they have, their economies have been growing very dynamically. You know, they, there's so much dynamism in these economies. For example, China, mainland China has been growing at the rate of 9% a year over the past eight years unbelievable, 9%. And uh, Singapore at an average of 8% a year. So you have some real uh, dynamic economies there. Uh, occasionally, they are unstable. Uh, the unstable ones, unfortunately, are uh, in Latin America. A uh, good example is uh, Mexico, but the, another example is Brazil. Brazil has tremendous potential. However, each time they take the right steps, they go three, four steps forward, and then they fall backward. And that has created some problems in, as far as Brazil is concerned. So you, that's another thing which we need to watch out for. Many have important state sectors. As a pro, uh, during the process, uh, process of uh, moving towards the free market system, there's a lot of privatization taking place simultaneously. That is, state enterprises are being sold to private entrepreneurs. Okay? But still, in many, many of these countries in the emerging markets, the state 
uh, sector plays a dominant role, especially in infrastructure. Uh, demand for foreign capital and technology is high. Obviously, as these countries are trying to develop and grow much more rapidly, they want more foreign capital as well as foreign technology. And there, here is an area which the U.S. and the West could help uh, in their economic development. At, at the same time, we can help ourselves in terms of higher rate of return on investment. Uh, these countries also have large populations and with massive demand for infrastructure and consumer goods. Okay. That's why you find uh, Pepsi and Coca-Cola in China, India, and all the other countries. Okay. So there's tremendous market both for consumer goods as well as, um, as, well as for infrastructure. And I think later when Jimmy talks, he'll talk about consumer goods or some of the industrial products which he's selling, which really fits into this particular pattern. Uh, some of the drawbacks uh, in, uh, in the emerging markets is they often lack respect for intellectual property rights, and that's a big problem. Uh, the U.S. economy is more a service economy. That is, I mean, if you remember the stages of economic development, countries go through basically three stages at least. One is agriculture, and then we move to manufacturing, and third phase is uh, services and technology. So we are in the third phase, and that's where U.S. has a comparative advantage. And uh, some countries, like China, do not fully appreciate the importance and value of intellectual property rights. And that's something we always have friction with China. So they do not respect the intellectual property rights. So when, as far as investment is concerned, we've got to be careful about that. Yes, please. Well, I understand that China has established a patent department, I'll call it, office. I don't know how much. Yet they're honoring our laws and we're honoring theirs. But I'm curious to know, you know, we know what we can do about infringement on intellectual property in the states, but I'm curious to know what we can do in the rest of the world. Well, it has to be worked through the WTO, that is the World Trade Organization, which is a follow up of GATT, GATT. And that is the organization which would, uh, uh, and China hasn't yet joined GATT. And this is one of the things which the U.S. is uh, pushing for, unless China respects U.S. I mean, or anybody's intellectual property, you cannot enter GAP. Okay, that's one of the things which is which being discussed. And Did you just say WIPO? WIPO? WTO. That's World Trade Organization. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, but that's an important point because uh, when you have a comparative advantage in a particular sector and if you're not able to get uh, you transfer technology and, uh, and get paid for it, I think that's a big problem. They do not have uh, smooth functioning uh, capital markets, some of them. Uh, the capital markets sometimes boom and then suddenly fall. Uh, that is partly because their capital markets may, are not as sophisticated as ours, so they do not have the disclosure requirements, the accounting systems are different. So you find uh, this ripple effect and also the, the monetary policy uh, is an important factor. And some of these emerging markets do not have the institutions in place like the SEC, which we have, an equivalent to the SEC. So the regulatory bodies are not in place or have just been um, placed there and they haven't yet implemented the policies fully. So you have some of these kind of problems in the emerging markets. Uh, the nature and competition of uh, the regulatory environment is quite different. Again, uh, just uh, following up on what I said earlier, because the institutions, along whenever you have a change, when con countries are in transition, moving from command economic systems to the free market system, along with that you should have appropriate institutions, both regulatory institutions and others, that will allow for transition to the market system, and they are not yet in place or slowly being implemented. And next, since they are not since they are not mature markets like uh, Western Europe or U.S., Japan, etc., uh, these markets have ups and downs. And so, and a proper analysis has to has to be taken. Anybody who's interested in emerging markets should analyze these countries carefully and look at them from the standpoint of medium to long term investment, and not as a place for short term investments. If you are looking at emerging markets for the short term, I think you'll be sadly surprised. It's not the place to make a quick buck. Okay? Unless you try to use the stock market, uh, you could if you're a good analyst. Uh, 
And the, the last item, as far as these uh, um, emerging markets is concerned, is they trade among themselves a lot. So they do not quite totally depend upon the West. They do trade among themselves, like the ASEAN group of countries, or China, the greater China, China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, or uh, South Asia. So they have diversified themselves, and therefore, you know, that's another interesting characteristic one should want look at, because when you're trying to penetrate this market, you should be aware of that. Uh, next, let me uh, show you. Uh, transparency, which indicates what are some of the economic reforms that have been implemented or is being implemented in these countries. Again, uh, here we are talking about the movement towards uh, the free market system. Now you have India, for example, has eased foreign investment restrictions, lowered income taxes, reduced tariffs, made currency convertible. Currency convertibility in the past, uh, you couldn't just convert local currency to foreign currency. Okay. Now you could in the current account. I don't know if you're familiar with balance payments, but you could. So the Indian rupee is convertible in the current account, but not in the capital account. Capital account is in the sense, uh, let me give you an example. So if you're an Indian citizen and you had some savings and you wanted to invest in IBM shares in the New York Stock Exchange, you can't do that. That is capital outflow and it's capital account. Whereas current account is if an uh, Indian company or a multinational in India wants to import uh, equipment, they could do that. If they need uh, dollars, they can take the rupees and convert it. So that's convertibility. Now Brazil has eliminated most tariffs. The tariff levels have come down drastically, okay? And uh, there's been a lot of deregulation, privatization going on. Now, Poland has implemented certain policies. Poland is uh, doing relatively well and is uh, growing quite uh, rapidly when you compare it with other Eastern European countries. South Africa, of course, uh, it's a newcomer, but there is going to be a lot of change, and I think under Mandela, I think, Things to look good, and the investment in South Africa is going to increase over time. And as I mentioned earlier, South Africa's GDP is 45% of whole of Africa, so it's a big market. Turkey, Turkey has been liberalizing for quite some time. Argentina, because the Argentine peso is respect to the US dollar one to one, they have a system of exchange rate, and they are also liberalizing their economies. Mexico, I don't have to mention because you know too much about Mexico. Uh, there's a lot, I mean, there's tremendous amount of uh, liberalization, although the recent uh, issue uh, deals more with monetary policy and exchange rate systems in Mexico, which has created the case of crisis. South Korea has uh, performed extremely well. Uh, uh, Syed and I were in Korea, I mean, about 10 days ago. We attended a conference there, made a presentation on Chebols, that is the conglomerates, the <coughs> South Korean conglomerates, they are done extremely well. And times are changing and so will the, uh, will the Chebols, okay? so that things are going to change. And uh, the new thing in uh, South Korea right now is the scandal you must have heard of about the bribery of the former uh, prime minister, but that's something else. Uh, then if you look at the China bloc, there's China, Hong Kong, and uh, Taiwan. China, I mean, Hong Kong has been the freest market. Next to that would be Taiwan. And China, of course, has kind of conducted a lot of liberalization since 1980, 1978. Brunei, a small country which I mentioned earlier, Malaysia, Singapore. So all these countries, you can, if you, when you look at this, you see that there's tremendous reforms taking place. And some of these policies are non-reversible. That means you've taken certain steps forward and you cannot go backward. And when you have policy reforms especially when they're correct policies, uh, which are irreversible, then you can more or less say that the economic fundamentals of these countries look good. And that's why despite all the problems which, is, which we see nowadays in Mexico, the economic fundamentals of Mexico are strong. And the policies, some of the institutions and policies which are in place in Mexico, make Mexico look very solid uh, compared to the rest of Latin America. Okay? Uh, uh, let me show you the uh, last uh, overhead uh, here. 
which talks about the sectoral opportunities for American businesses. Okay, what are the areas uh, where U.S. businesses could penetrate in these markets? Okay. Information technology, including telecommunications, computer ha hardware, and software. Uh, many, one of the problems of these emerging markets is they, had, they did not invest adequately in infrastructure in the past. So suddenly, when, when they started liberalizing these economies and moving towards market systems, they're finding tremendous amount of bottlenecks in transportation, in power. If you go to the Philippines, practically every day you have power cut. Uh, the power is shut off for half hour, one hour, because the demand is so much and the supply is just not there. Transportation, of course, you can look at the roads, uh, how clogged they are, and the potholes and things like that. Uh, there's tremendous burden there. Uh, you can look at telephone systems. Again, the demand for telephone services is so great, but the supply is not there. Okay. So every aspect of infrastructure which we take for granted here in the United States is badly missing or in great demand or the supply hasn't kept up with demand. So there is there's an estimate, a World Bank estimate, that approximately all these emerging markets require about 500 billion dollars of investment in infrastructure over the next 10 years. 500 billion, that is a lot of investment. And that means tremendous opportunities for companies, uh, especially a number of US companies, I don't know if you've been following, in the energy sector, companies like Ensearch, Enron Corporation. Enron Corporation is looking overseas. They, they feel that the market is overseas. They have a huge project, uh, mainly they're fighting for a project in India, in China. That's where the action is. So emerging markets, uh, that's where some of the major infrastructure projects are going to be. Environmental technology, if you go to developing countries, you'll notice the quality of air, water, everything is relatively bad. They do not have proper treatment systems and investment needs to be made there. And they do not have the technology. So again, there is opportunities for American business. Energy, I mentioned that, electric power. Healthcare, again, you're talking about pharmaceuticals. Uh, this, given the size of the population in these countries, there's going to be tremendous demand for pharmaceuticals, biotechnology, and other things. Transportation, I mentioned earlier. Then financial services. Uh, many of these countries, uh, the banking systems are behind times, and they're state-controlled. So they are being privatized. So there, again, is a role for American banks to get involved. And uh, that's happening. Uh, banking, insurance, and this uh, securities business. And consulting is a very important area. I mentioned about the services as far as the US is concerned. The service industry, is, we are talking about consulting, providing consulting services, various types of consulting services, engineering consulting, management consulting, whatever. Everything is demand for that. Uh, finally, advanced materials in the chemical industry and industrial machinery, earth moving equipment. So, you know, it's, all these things are there. And of course, agriculture, one thing which I left out here is agriculture, both in terms of imports of agricultural products from the United States, as well as technology, agricultural technology to be transferred to these developing countries so that they can improve the yield per acre of whatever product they are involved in. Uh, with this, let me uh, wind up because uh, and let uh, Jimmy make his presentation, and then after that, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer. Thank you. Well, thank you, and I certainly appreciated Dr. Gasper's presentation and what he had to, to say. Uh, it's very interesting coming from a manufacturing point of view and a, um, actually being in a, in a business that is exporting to all of these emerging markets to, to see the, the overall analysis of these markets. And it, I, I wish I could just share with you how much everything he said makes sense and how it all flows together. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And in my talk, there's, there's really three things that I just want to share with you today. I want to tell you a little bit about who TechSpray is, just so you know the mindset of what we're coming from. Uh, and then I want to talk to you a little bit about emerging markets, specifically in Southeast Asia and Asia as a whole. That is, that is where most of my expertise would come from. 
And then finally, we want to, I want to give you some tips. Uh, I, I assume there's a few of you uh, who are probably in here for extra credit. Uh, and uh, as, the, as the dean has already mentioned, he's looked up my record and he knows my, uh, my grades already, but the odds of me getting extra credit now are probably a little, uh, a little late. But, uh, so I'll try to keep this somewhat entertaining and give you a chance to, to hopefully get something out of this as well. Uh, certainly being a chemist and going into a chemical industry, I've been with Tech Spray for about eight and a half years. Uh, and about really four years ago, uh, there was a need for some technical expertise on the marketing side. And so I started working on that. And having moved from that, uh, now being the marketing manager of Tech Spray, with part of my responsibilities being Southeast Asia as direct sales. Um, Tech Spray, just to, to give you an idea of who we are, we are a manufacturer of chemicals. And all of our chemicals are used in the electronics industry. Um, so very little of actually what we sell is used here in, in Amarillo. Most of what we do goes outside of Amarillo. Uh, as was mentioned, we're approximately a $20 million company uh, right here in Amarillo. We are privately held. Last year we grew by 30%. This year we're expected to grow by 33%. Uh, and we're on track to double our size in three years. So we've had tremendous growth. And certainly a lot of these emerging markets are a good part of that growth for us. Uh, right now all of our total exports range about 12% of the company. And that goes into Canada, uh, certainly Latin America, as we mentioned, Mexico, uh, Europe. But Asia, in the Southeast Asian area, and that includes, when I say that in, in our definition, we include Australia in that as well, because they're all kind of over in that same part of the world. Uh, we're certainly expecting a, probably a 20 or 30 percent growth in our product. Um, let me tell you just a little bit uh, about these Asian markets, and I'd like to go into a little bit of specifics about the different ones. I travel over to Asia two to three times a year, spend a couple of weeks there, and, and visit with our different distributors. And I think it's important for you to understand, if, you're, if you are... Uh, going to work for a business, and you're going to go into some of these emerging markets, it's, it's important to understand the market, but it's important to understand some of the different things that are there. So let me describe to you tech spray structure for all of our export companies. And let me describe the United States and how that differs with the exports. In the United States, all of our products are sold through distribution. We are not a company that sells anything direct. And I think you'll find in most companies, that's the standard, uh, standard route for getting your products to market is through some sort of a distribution channel. Now, when you're going over to these emerging markets, there, there are many, many obstacles that you have to overcome in order to get your products sold in that, that country. And one of the key things to, to get them sold there uh, is to find a distributor or a group of distributors. Find a key individual in each one of these countries. And I'll talk about the different countries and, uh, and how the whole thing works in just a moment. But you want to find each one of these different countries. Is it possible to move this map over here a little bit? Now, I don't know, they, they may teach geography a little bit better in the, in the business side than they did in the chemistry side, um, but it, it helped me a lot to, to look at a map and see where we were going, especially on my last trip when uh, I was flying north when I thought it was supposed to be flying south. So uh, it's important to know where you're headed, and that way you make your, your trips a little easier. Now, in these Asian markets, you, you do have several large markets, and uh, Dr. Gasper just a moment ago showed you a lot of the markets that have these, these large potential or large buying power, so a large amount of cash in order to purchase. Um, but it's important to put those in perspective and also see that the markets in these emerging markets are changing very rapidly. And uh, let me just give you an example. Texbury has distribution um, in all of, all of there. We're working on Japan right now. You have South Korea. China is a new area. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But you have Hong Kong here, which of course is going to be part of China in 1997. Uh, there's some huge question about what's going to happen with the business economy in the different areas as China does take over Hong Kong. You've got Taiwan, uh, which is now just now starting to have more negotiations with uh, mainland China, and we'll see how that works out. You've got Singapore way down here at the bottom, Malaysia, Thailand, and some of the other countries, the Philippines, and Indonesia, that were already mentioned, that are, that are being developed. Now what TechSpray sees, we go out into each one of these different countries, and we search for a distributor who can allow us to get our products to market in each one of these different countries. Now usually we, we assign them as a master distributor. They may have to go to sub-dealers in order to sell the product. Um, but uh, each one of the different distributorships does their own, own infrastructure. Now there has been a major shift in the electronics industry. As you know, a huge amount of the electronics products, uh, all the consumer electronics, all the way to computers, a huge amount of what we purchase even here in the United States is manufactured in the Southeast Asian area. And most of that manufacturing is shifting to these emerging type markets. For example, Singapore. 
for years was the largest manufacturer of disk drives in the world. They held about 80% of the market in disk drives for the entire world were made in Singapore. Right now, um, I don't know what their percentage is, but I know the outflow of those disk drive manufacturers is amazing. Uh, they're probably down to, to much less than 20% at this point would be my estimate. Because people are going to what we would call more emerging markets. And again, I'm talking from the industrial side. The consumer side, there's still a lot of consumer dollars to be spent down in the, the small country of Singapore. And if you haven't had a chance, I, I know it kind of got a bad rap with the caning. Uh, but Singapore is one of my favorite countries in the entire world. It's probably the most beautiful city uh, you will ever have an opportunity to see. Uh, they talk about it being outrageous and, you know, you can't do vandalism but you will never see a, a piece of gum on the sidewalk. You will never see a piece of trash in the gutter. Um, just a beautiful city. But they pay a lot of money to have this infrastructure to keep things there. Um, to give you an idea, there's a lot of dollars to spend in Singapore, but if you're a, a student or, or someone a young age, about our same age, do you have any idea what you would have to spend in order to buy a car in Singapore? You may have a clue. You have to spend thirty-five to forty thousand dollars to buy a permit to buy a car. And after you spend $40,000 to buy a permit, which may take you up to three years to get, you have to pay 100% duty on that car. So if you were to buy a $10,000 car here in the United States, uh, it would pro probably cost you, by the time the duty and the freight and everything was added, somewhere between eighty dollars and $120,000 for that same car. Um, so you can see it's, it's difficult to do business in a country like that, and it's difficult to do this cheap labor in a country where, where you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on, a, on an economy car and uh, millions of dollars on an apartment. So a lot of these manufacturers are going to uh, emerging markets right around it. So we see all of our Singapore people going into Malaysia. Malaysia is a very much a rapidly growing market for the electronics industry. Indonesia and the Philippines. So from a marketing manager's point of view, and, and from what I look at, Singapore is still the center of activity. You'll find most of the corporate offices for all of these different manufacturers are in Singapore. A lot of their buying offices are in Singapore. So what you look for is having a market centered in Singapore um, with outreaches into the Philippines, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, and Thailand. So you can see everything there being centered basically around uh, the small island of Singapore. And so we see that very much happening with our products. And in fact, our distributor in Singapore is responsible for all of those various countries. And he does have some dealership there. Um, uh, Dr. Gasper was, was just talking about the, the differences in these different countries. Um, the, the contrast between going from Singapore to Malaysia uh, or to, uh, sorry, the Philippines is phenomenal. Um, I don't know how many of you had, the, again, the chance to go to the Philippines. When you talk about potholes and a few potholes and a few congested streets and the electricity being shut off for hours at a time, that is a major understatement. Um, when you're in the Philippines, there, there's no telling. Um, the cars are, are crazy. They're actually made out of tin. They have tin made cars that uh, the people can buy very cheap. Uh, it's very difficult. It's very cheap labor. But you also run into that same mindset. You have to understand the culture of these various countries, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. The next region of, of emerging markets that we see happening is, is in the Hong Kong-China region. You hear a lot in the newspapers about the opportunities for investment in China, and uh, there are opportunities there, but as was mentioned, while there's a lot of people in China and there's a lot of money to be spent, uh, the actual amount of money per individual is very, very small. Uh, the Chinese marketplace is difficult, and really you can actually break China down. It's, it's just three different regions. You have Beijing, which is right up here towards the top. You have Shanghai, which is the port city, and then right across uh, about 100 kilometers outside of Hong Kong, you have Gangzhou. And those are the three main marketplaces uh, for China. The rest of it, uh, there, there's very little uh, progressive economy happening. Now what we see happening again, you have the same outflux that happened in Singapore, but now it's happening out of Hong Kong. Hong Kong used to be, and as was mentioned, is the, probably the freest uh, trade center in the entire world. Also a very beautiful city, and, and you talk about a population of six million people. Um, now think of that in an area that's not much bigger than Amarillo and Canyon. Um, so you've got six million people that are pretty much concentrated in this, and not only that, it's very mountainous. So it's not like you have flat land like we have. So you have six million people in a very, very tight place. Um, and uh, we, yeah, we're just in South Korea, so uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment, but it's a uh, very, very, very crowded area, very expensive also to live in Hong Kong. So when you're talking about items that require a lot of labor to manufacture, most of that is going out into China at this point. So if you want to deal your products into China, Hong Kong is a good place to start. Find someone there. Again, the buying offices tend to be there, the controlling, the research and development done in Hong Kong, labor being manufactured in China itself. And then you have another country 
which is kind of all by itself, Taiwan. From our point of view, Taiwan basically supports its own economy. Um, the Chinese have in the past pretty much hated Taiwan, and Taiwan's pretty much hated the Chinese government, and there's a lot of conflict there, so obviously very little trade, and hopefully that's, that's coming close to making some progress. Uh, but the Taiwanese market is also very, very different. Here, we're in, the, in uh, Singapore, Malaysia. You may go to a factory, and there may be uh, 5,000 people that work in this computer-derived factory. You go into Taiwan, and there are hundreds of thousands of small, what we would term, 1920 sweatshops. Uh, these people are maybe 10, 15 people in a company making some sort of a computer board for someone. Uh, so the way you get your products to those people is different, and you have to find someone there that, that does that and can do that in that area. I also see, uh, not specifically with our products, but you do see a lot of people who are handling Taiwan also handling China. Uh, not necessarily exporting from them, but maybe handling both countries together. Then you move on up to another area we have, which is uh, South Korea. South Korea, at least for tech spray right now, is our largest export area. And I think that's mainly because we have such a good distributor there. I'm not saying by any means it's the largest market. Um, with the Taiwanese and the South Koreans, you have an advantage in selling American products in those countries because both of them love American products. Uh, the Taiwanese, in fact, uh, we, we were offering to print all of our labels in Chinese, and they said, no, we don't want Chinese labels. We want American labels because American products sell better in Taiwan. Uh, if it has Taiwanese label on it, they, they think it's lower quality, um, and they want to buy a, buy a U.S. made product. South Korea is very similar. The South Koreans are, are very appreciative of the United States and, and what we helped them out with in the Korean War, and are very receptive, in most cases, to American companies, and work very, very well. Then, of course, you have Japan. Now, Japan, um, again, being, I believe, second with the United States, as was just mentioned, in, uh, in global, or I'm sorry, in domestic product. Uh, however, they are in a, a major recession. The Japanese don't have very much money to spend on investment into new areas. And you also have the exact same thing. It's very expensive to live and work in Japan. So anything that is hand-related or, or hand-assembly requires a lot of uh, manufacture goes off. Those people in Japan are going back down into this region, Malaysia, uh, the Philippines, and Indonesia, is where you see a lot of the Japanese manufacturing moving. Again, you've got to have the core business there because it's still run, manufacturing facilities being done off-site. So that's the basic structure, and that's the way TechSpray, when we approach the market, we go by, by attaching to each one of these different key countries and then having them, them go off into the various areas. Now, I, I would like to, to just give you, and, and this is again in case any of you happen to go off and... Uh, find yourself like I did accidentally uh, doing some exporting and doing these export markets. Let me give you what I consider the three keys to doing business in Southeast Asia. And I think these three keys work for Asia. I think they pretty much work with any export that you would do. But Asia uh, is kind of a special place. First of all, you, you must understand the market differences. Uh, and I think Dr. Gasper went through that in, in pretty good detail on some of the different things with the government. But you also have to approach different products are accepted different ways in different countries. And you must be very, very sensitive to those differences. Uh, a practical example with tech spray, products that sell in Taiwan uh, don't sell in Korea. Products that sell in Hong Kong are different than the ones that would sell in uh, the Singapore area, even though we're selling to the same industry. It's because of the cultural differences and the relationship you have with the distributor there. The second thing that you have to overcome, uh, which I find to be the most frustrating of all of them, is the language barrier. There is a significant language barrier to overcome with these various uh, organizations. Specifically, uh, anytime you're in uh, Singapore, Malaysia, any of the British colonies, Hong Kong, um, or the Philippines, the Spanish <coughs> colony, English is not a problem. Most of them speak at least uh, broken English quite well. In areas such as when you get it deep into China, Japan, as a matter of fact, I have difficulty with English. Uh, Korea is probably the worst with difficulty in English. Taiwan is very, very bad, uh, except we have an advantage there. We have an English, uh, an American, who happens to speak Chinese in Taiwan. Uh, so you must overcome the language barrier. You must print all your product literature in the language of the country. Uh, you must print all your labels. This also goes for Europe, by the way. Any product that's sold into Europe must be in the label of the country, must be in the language of the country it's sold into. Um, so a, a product that we sell into Europe has to have Spanish, French, German, English, and one more that I can't remember right now. It has to have all five languages on the label itself. So you must overcome the language barrier. And the third thing, um, which is sometimes funny, sometimes very embarrassing, is you have to overcome the uh, cultural barrier. You must understand how the culture functions in each one of the different cities. 
Now again, if you go to Hong Kong or Singapore where it was heavy British rule, Western culture has a very strong influence there, and you usually don't have a problem. But what we would consider general business practice in the United States is very unaccepted. And I'll, and I'll give you a, a couple of very simple examples, and one of them would be with a business card. Does anybody have any idea how you exchange business cards in Asia? Someone raised their hand in the back, but he's older than a student. So uh, what you've got here is, is when you exchange business cards, a business card in Asia is very, very important. It's much more than just a piece of paper as it would be in the United States. This is something that signifies my identity. It also has my title. Titles are very important. Uh, the main reason I took Asia as a marketplace is because our president, uh, Richard Russell, could not do business in several countries there, specifically Korea and Japan, because on his card it said president. So he could only visit with presidents of other countries, other companies. Um, and when he asked to go down on the factory floor and work with the workers, they, that was a major insult. They, they wouldn't allow him to do that. Um, so I guess I was lowly enough to, to be able to go over there and work where I needed to work. But when you do exchange a business card, you don't simply hand it to someone, you hand it with both hands out of respect. Uh, both hands on there, they take it with both hands, you receive it with both hands. You must have the print facing the, uh, facing the person you're exchanging cards with. You have to take it and you have to read it. Um, and if you're, if you're being extra polite, like if I was to accept your business card, I would look at it and I would make some sort of comment like, oh, I like your logo or that color matches, it's very close to ours, or some positive comment about the card. Uh, and that's important. You have to learn how to do this in order to, to, to get the business relationship going. Uh, if you just throw your card down on the table, you've immediately insulted someone, and you won't, uh, won't do much business with that customer. Another example uh, that happened to me in Korea, which is something that I was unaware of, this was after a long trip. Again, two weeks away from home is a long time, um, especially when you're, when you're working out in, uh, in a strange place. Uh, you go to Korea, they try to kill you with niceness. Everyone is opening the door for everyone. Everyone is doing everything constantly. We're always waiting to see who gets to sit where because that's important. Uh, and so after a couple of days, that got very frustrating. So we were going out to the car, and I was going with four other gentlemen. We had a two-hour drive to uh, our account. Going out to the car, I said, I'm tired of this. I'm just going to go sit down uh, in the back seat and get it over with. You know, I don't want to argue. Because in the, in the United States, we would consider the front seat by the driver to be kind of the primary or the nice seat. Um, and so I was just going to sit in the back and be on with it. Well, we drove for two hours. No one in the car said a word. Uh, no one spoke to anyone. I had no idea. I, had, uh, I didn't find out until about an hour later that I had greatly offended um, the president of another company and uh, the general manager of our distributor because I took the place of honor. Uh, and not only did I take the place of honor, I snatched the place of honor uh, very, very quickly. And uh, that offended them because then it was left for them two to decide which one of them took the least place of honor and which one of them took the next to the place of honor. Uh, because I sat in the wrong place in the car. Um, so you have to be very careful to the cultural differences. Um, something that's very simple, if you, if you do business in Asia, learn how to eat with chopsticks. Uh, if you want to impress people very quickly, just go to a restaurant, uh, and sometimes they'll give you a fork just because you look like an American. Uh, and if you pick up the chopsticks and can use them, you'll impress them and be able to do business. Um, I, I know my talk is a little less technical, uh, but hopefully you get one thing out of it, and that's there, there are very much two different sides to business. And this is, my, this is the close that I, that I want to leave with you. There's, there's the practical side that you have to look at. You have to understand your markets. You have to do your market studies. But in the end, and this goes to the United States or any exports that you might do, all of business comes down to relationships. It comes down to your relationship with your dealers or your distributors. It comes down to your relationships with the customers. And when you're doing exports, it's that much more difficult to develop those relationships uh, because you have to overcome the language and the cultural bar barriers that are involved there. Um, the one thing that I will say about the Asian marketplace is once you do overcome those relationships, those are relationships that you will quite literally have for a lifetime. Um, it's very difficult to earn the trust in an Asian area, um, but once you've earned that trust, it's very, very difficult um, to fall out of grace with that particular uh, company or individual. And uh, they will quite literally bring you to be your friends for life. Our Korean distributor is constantly sending my daughter presents and things like that, so a lot of things to develop relationships. Future things with TechSpray, we have a lot that we're looking for. We certainly expect these emerging markets. Right now, as I mentioned, they're 10% of our total sales. I expect them to be 15 and 20% uh, within the next three years. Uh, and as I said, they're right now on about a 25% growth pattern. So certainly a very large area for us, and we look for them to be uh, very important. So thank you very much. Yes, sir. You know you're going to want to do business with right. him forever. And um, once you found him, do you actually sell him the product and uh, let him worry with distributing you? And once you have him, uh, 
are you stuck with him forever? So you want to want to move on? Um, I pretty much give a distributor about three years. Um, again, as, as was as was mentioned, anytime you're looking at investing in these marketplaces, it is a is not a short-term investment. It's a long-term investment. And particularly with some of the obstacles to overcome, it can easily stretch out to two or three years before I will terminate a distributor. Uh, finding a distributor, there are many methods for finding a distributor. Uh, one is to go through government organizations. For example, Japan has something that's called JETRO, which is Japanese Economic Trade Organization. Uh, and they actually have an office here in Texas, down in Austin. And you can call them up and, and they, will, they will do a profile for your company and they'll give you a list of, of distributors and or uh, trade organizations that are handling products similar to yours, and that's a good way to get started. Um, another way is to just talk to, not necessarily your competitors, but obviously tech spray sells a specific product to a specific market. Uh, we can talk to other people that we know of that sell similar products to the same marketplace and say, well, who are your dealers, who are your distributors, uh, and then talk to those different ones. Ultimately, you have to go to the country, um, interview them, talk to them, and uh, make a selection, some of it based on faith. In general, um, especially with an export, you usually have some sort of a minimum requirement that they have to purchase and product from you in order to be considered a dealer. All of these countries want exclusive distributorship, indicating you won't set up competition with them. Uh, and then, the very reason I have to travel over there twice a year or more is to support them. Take them out, show them how to sell, show them where the products get sold, encourage them, select the right products for their marketplace, uh, and work with them a lot. It takes a lot of, it takes a lot of energy uh, to work with these markets as opposed to working with something like in the U.S. But hopefully answer. Well, once you get them, are you stuck with them? Can you uh, um, No, them? You, you can actually dissolve them. It, it's important to, when you're establishing your initial contracts, it's very important to, um, to establish it so that there is a way out. Uh, one key phrase that you'll hear anytime you deal with, with an Asian company is face, saving face. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw the, the movie Rising Sun with Sean Connery that talked a lot about that, and that is very real, uh, some of the things that, that go on there. And so it's very important that whatever you do, you save face. So I would not just fire someone. We would decide that it is in our mutual best interest for us to find another distributor um, and things like that because you never want to, to, to lose face with a customer. But it can be done. Well, yeah, a lot of it's about getting you know, into these new markets. And what are the difficulties in getting out of the United States with your product? Uh, actually, exporting to the United States is no, really mean, not... For us here to get out of the United States to export to them. Okay, for us to, to actually get our market, to, get our to export here. our products? Right, to get our product out of this country. A lot of that depends on the, the country itself and, and the infrastructure that was, that was mentioned before. China, for example, is very much encouraging investment but they want foreigners, or Westerners specifically, to invest money in China for developing products in China. They make it very difficult for you to sell a product from the United States to China. Now, if you want to build a plant over there, uh, they'll bend over backwards to help you. But if you want to bring your product in, uh, it's sometimes very, very difficult. Another okay, issue I was trying to address is that our U.S. government regulations in taking our product out of this United States into these foreign countries. Right. Say you're, you want to export your chemicals now into any country. Okay, what are the problems of getting those released from the United States to get those products there? From, from, from our experience, at least with our company, there are no problems. Uh, the problems only exist. Um, the United States, they're, they're, at least our impression of it, is basically if you can sell it in the United States, you're more than welcome to, to sell it outside the United States. Obviously, with chemicals, there's a lot of transportation issues that have to be dealt with. Uh, but that's just a, a matter of cost. That's not a matter of, of legalism. Yes, sir. In problem uh, in demanding uh, your exact former license and that sort of thing before um, they let it to be imported. Right. You like, not want to reveal. Um, we have read that, and, and our position was um, it's one thing to have the exact formula, it's another to be able to put it together. So uh, we pretty much have released formulations when requested. Uh, with one exception, and there is one product that we consider fairly secretive, and that one we just chose not to sell in that country. Uh, but that, that happens on a very regular basis. They want to know your exact everything. They want to know the, the thickness of the can and everything. They want the very, very specific specifications. Uh, which is another reason why it is critical to have a distributor in that country that recognizes what's going on in that country. And Japan is the classic example of this. Um, they, they have a Japanese term, which I can't remember, but it basically means wall. There's a huge wall of red tape uh, in order to get products into Japan, unless you happen to be Japanese. And if you're Japanese and you've worked in the industry, you know that 
well, all I have to do is call so-and-so, uh, and, and they'll say, oh, well, all you have to do is fill out this form instead of these 50, and that'll take care of it. And there are many things like that, and that's why you, you've got to know the right people in the country. You mentioned uh, Hong Kong. Yes, sir. What do you envision or what do you think is going to happen as far as your marketing in Hong Kong when it reverts back to China? Um, at this point, I don't expect, and, and this is the opinion I get from my, my uh, friends and distributors in Hong Kong, they don't expect that there's going to be a significant change. They think the Chinese government is wise enough to recognize what a gold mine they have in Hong Kong uh, and to do much influence on that, certainly in the short term, short term being 10, 15 years, uh, would, would only be to hurt them. Uh, so I think Hong Kong will pretty much uh, go along as normal. If anything, it may help because all of our products that sold in Hong Kong, I shouldn't say all, probably 60%, and I expect that to grow to 90, actually end up in China. Um, and so when the walls come down, it'll be easier to get your product through Hong Kong into China. But I expect Hong Kong will still be the, the key city for doing business. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Gaspar? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question for Dr. Gaspar. Uh, I just wanted to know that there are varying uh, um, documentation regarding the number of people in the countries like India and China who are the real middle class, uh, some say 200 million in India, 300 million in China. What is your perception, actually, people with disposable income who can really purchase uh, items of consumer goods? I think uh, <coughs> the middle class you're talking about, I think that's the target audience for most uh, U.S. exports or most ex exports from anywhere, because they do have the purchasing power that uh, uh, Jim was talking about. Uh, so I think, uh, and it's growing. You can, that depends upon the income distribution, how the whether the economic growth is having a trickle-down impact in, in the country. Uh, it, you're right, the estimates for India is about 150 to 250 million, and China is growing rapidly. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers for that. And that is the target of audience when you're talking about consumer goods. But when you talk about industrial goods, it's more the macro number, because we can talk about power, electric power, transportation, uh, telephones, for that, you have to look at the overall number of people and the number of businesses which are being created. And, uh, and that's growing, and uh, that's very clear in terms of infrastructure, the tremendous in, uh, investment which is required is there. Yes. Um, what effect, if any, do you think that the recent um, election results in Poland will have on the economy? Well, yeah. you see, whenever economies move from one extreme to another, move from a, a common system to a totally democratic system, it's like a pendulum. So you need to swing a couple of times before it comes to stability. And so what happened was when you had Lech Valencia elected, you know, moved from a common system to a, a democratic system, people didn't like that because in many cases, not only in Poland, many of the Eastern European countries which I visited and also the Soviet Union, I mean, and in Russia, uh, people have democracy, they have freedom, uh, but they don't have food to eat or clothing to wear. So they say, great, and this is what we have got, but uh, how about the real stuff? You know? uh, part of the reason is the way it was sold, I don't know if you followed the, what happened in Eastern Europe, uh, the way it was sold is that when you move to the free market system and democracy, voila, you look at the US, they showed a picture of all the US supermarkets, all the food and clothing. Are. So people, uh, being naive, uh, knowing no, nothing else about the uh, Western system and how countries achieve that, they assume that the moment you switch to democracy and free market system, you'll have everything in place. And uh, when they had, when they got democracy and then they started moving to the free market system, the only thing they felt or went through was more pain because you got to have this uh, transition phase. And uh, so then many of them were disappointed. But Poland has done uh, relatively well in that regard. And you can see the supermarkets, you find things uh, coming up, you have more choice, and the income has been steadily improving. But still, people are not too satisfied. They feel maybe the old system, to an extent, was better. You had to stand in line for an hour or a half hour, but still, you got the stuff relatively cheap. Now, you don't have money, but you have the choice. So which is better? So now, it's sort of a dilemma. And so now they moved to the uh, uh, to the new government, and now he has promised something, and we'll see what happens. And they'll switch back and go to a more democratic type, and then eventually, another 10, 15 years, they'll have a system, hopefully, something which is relatively stable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
think the situation in Poland pretty similar to what it is in, uh, CI in the CIS, like maybe basically <coughs> Russia? No, I think CIS, the Commonwealth of Indian <coughs> State, especially if you look at the uh, Russian republics, uh, like the, uh, the, the Central Asian republics like Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, all these places, they are really black uh, I visited, I went as a consultant uh, to the U.S. State Department on a project to Turkmenistan. I know many of you may not know where Turkmenistan is. It's just north of Iran. And you would be surprised how backward they are. They are behind at least, I would say, because of the Soviet rule for 50, 70 years, they are behind times by at least 50 years. The Russians have basically exploited those countries, those republics. Uh, they just sucking out the resources. Uh, the Russians, on one hand, were making fun of the British and the French and all of the others, saying that they are all colonial masters and things like that. But in reality, they were practicing colonialism of the worst kind. And those countries are really behind them. So that's why they are trying not to be associated with, uh, with, with the Russians. So they're way behind. And in, in terms of economic policies, there again, uh, they are way behind Eastern Europe because the Eastern European countries had some influence. And some of them, especially the Czech Republic, used to, and even Poland, had a big private sector before the Russians moved in, uh, before the Soviets moved in. So, it's, so they are used to some of these things, and they do know. But, uh, but the republics, totally different. And the same case is also with Russia. When you look at the Russians, who are the capitalists in Russia now? They were the same guys, the same communists of the past. Overnight, they have become capitalists. The same guys who were uh, you know, controlling the economy politically have now become Democrats. Uh, Jarnowski, I know he, he's the ultra-nationalist. His party is called the Liberal Democratic Party. Is anything but liberal or democratic. But uh, it's going to be seen what happens in the next, in the next election. And there again, it's going to be a switch, a swing back and forth. You have moved to Yeltsin and his group, and now you'll find things going backwards. To, I wouldn't be surprised that the Russians, during the next elections, they'll go more to a, choosing a more communist type of government. Uh, and you also got to look at the history of these countries. They haven't been used to democracy. And the only thing they know is uh, they needed a strong man at the top to, I mean, uh, an authoritarian to, to suggest policies and implement uh, things. So, they still, it's new to them. And they all yearn for the good old days, uh, but, you know, things are going to change, but, you know, it has to go back and forth before things really stabilize. I just came in, so I don't know if you addressed this question or not. Uh, in the business journals and I feel like Business Week, Wall Street Journal, we often see frequent comparisons made between uh, China and India as emerging business markets. Uh, what is your assessment of the two markets? Uh, uh, it's which is the stronger infrastructure, which has more potential? Uh, very involved question, uh, because these two countries, as you know, are quite different. One is a communist country, uh, China, India's uh, democracy, the world's largest democracy. <coughs> political system is totally different. So whereas in China you could trust and implement policies, in India, which is really a democracy, you have political pluralism and you find uh, there's always a debate. The moment you introduce uh, change, there's one big discussion. Everybody and his mother has his right to say what he wants. And so the policy implementation is a lot more uh, difficult to implement in a country like India because of well, there are a number of people, including the uh, Wall Street Journal, people have said, well, democracy sometimes is really an expensive commodity, and whether poor countries or third world countries can really afford democracy. Well, it's something uh, people need to think about, but at the same time, it's really stable. There was another article about, in the Wall Street Journal, I don't know if you read it a couple of months ago, by Karen Elliott House, she's the vice president of Dow Jones uh, International. And she had visited both uh, China and India. And she met with different people. And the analysis which was presented by a Japanese diplomat, I think that's very telling. He says that on the surface, when you look at China, it's 
very stable. You don't see chaos, that much chaos. But underneath that, there's no stability at all. It's just like, say, Deng Xiaoping. If Deng Xiaoping goes, it's a toss-up. You know what's going to happen? Because you have one authoritarian right there, and if he goes, the policies could crumble. And whereas on the other hand, if you look at India, total chaos. I don't know how many of you have been to India. You know, there's always a lot of discussion, strikes here, uh, everything is there. Total chaos. But underneath that chaos, there is tremendous stability. That is the democratic system. The institutions are all in place. So the chaos which you see is differing of opinions. That is the political pluralism. And I think the US, we are used to political pluralism. So I think to an extent, we would be able to understand that a lot better. But what is the impact? That's the political side. And what is the impact on the economy? Well, because when the greater control you have in the economy, and the greater power you have to implement policies, the quicker you'll see results. So in the case of China, you see economic growth growing in uh, the uh, country growing at about 9% a year, real GDP growth. Because you could implement it, and if there's any dissent or if there's anybody trying to create trouble, he just vanishes from the scene. <laughs> Tenement Square. Anyway, you know, the, the person just vanishes. So you could really bring about force uh, uh, changes there. But you cannot do that anymore. So you, because the moment you want to create uh, policy changes, greater competition, we have a whole bunch of corporations, the big conglomerates in India, who have political influence. They will try to maintain status quo. And then you have the others, the labor movement, uh, who wants to dismantle things. So you'll find a lot of things happening. Uh, so progress is a lot slower. So that if you look at India, India's GDP growth is about 5% and 5% a year. So you have 5% versus China's, which is almost double. This is a very superficial and simplistic way of putting the whole thing, because there's a lot more to this uh, I can talk about. But you know, I hope I'm trying to I convey the message. Yes, please. Uh, is India dismantling their uh, passenger rail service because it's not profitable? And are they keeping their rails in place for future commercialization? Well, the rail system will continue to be there. I think that is, uh, many, many have argued that is one of the gifts of the British when they left India. There are two things which the British left behind in India. One is a good educational system, and the second is the railways, Indian railways. And if it were not for the Indian railways, I think you'll have a, even more uh, chaos in, as far as transportation is concerned. Uh, the traffic is unbelievable, and, and some of the routes are really proper. They're not really subsidized. There's certain routes which are subsidized, and certain, some of them are not. But the question of privatization, I think it will be one of the last public sector enterprises that will be privatized. Uh, because it really, I mean, the, it's the largest employer. Two million people. It employs two million people. Mm -hmm. So if you go to privatize, you've got to do it in different st in stages. And I think that there are more uh, pressing sectors where you could privatize and get money in private capital into rather than getting at the railways. I mean, like the power sector, the telecommunication system, all these could be privatized. Uh, and now, India is really notorious for the role of the public sector that we started with, uh, with uh, Nehru this time. And uh, it's slowly changing. And some of these sectors, like the manufacturing, steel sector, a large portion of steel production is still done. So things are, things are going to change. Uh, how do you sell engineering services? Does it have to be tied to a product to these countries? It depends. It's a, lot, it's a lot different way of doing business than it's like a product. See, if it's engineering services, I know if you, if you could be a bit more specific, like what, what do you have in mind? Okay. Now, uh, those, you could sell it in two forms. One is if it's a major project, then you see through the World Bank. You know, the World Bank has an international center, and they say, well, they need certain things to be provided. And that's one way. The, the other is private sector. There are big private companies in uh, India that would directly purchase engineering services to make plant and equipment or whatever. And, uh, and the, the 
difference, there's a big difference again when you talk about India and China in that regard, because India has got a better legal system and therefore it enforces property rights, uh, intellectual property rights. So that could be incorporated when you're trying to sell engineering products or engineering services so that you see that you get your royalty beat. Uh, so you could deal directly with a private company depending upon the services. There's a big company called Larson and Tauber, you know, which is uh, partly uh, foreign -owned. Now, they are always involved in uh, construction, uh, especially engineering construction, power plants, chemical plants, distillation columns, various things. So they do import technology. So my, I No, I mean, things have changed. Uh, I mean, the international reserves of India uh, now stand at about $23 billion. Well, yeah. other, other countries. Yeah, if you're talking about all countries in general, most of these, which, which I indicated, uh, there are very few of them that do not have the money to uh, pay for that. And especially if you talk about engineering, uh, because there are two types of goods which are sold in countries. One is capital goods, and the other one is consumer goods. Now, yours is industrial, so it comes under, you can say it's also part of capital goods. Now, capital goods, there's always a big demand, and the government in many of these countries provide a high priority. Because capital goods go towards investment. And investment leads to job creation, economic growth, and government revenue. That's the, that's the preferred mode rather than going for consumer goods, which goes basically down the tubes. And uh, you find it doesn't, consumer goods, unless there's tremendous investment in the country, like Jim mentioned, you've been opening, uh, setting up a plant in China, in which case you're trying to generate jobs, because then it no longer is a consumer good, you're talking about the investment being made. So that's why these countries are always talking about, okay, we don't want you to export whatever from the US. Why did you come and produce the stuff in our country? You see the market. You've got a huge market, more than terms of uh, GDP and or maybe in terms of population, why don't you produce this product in our country? So you bring the investment, you're going to generate jobs, you're going to pay taxes. So if you look at the big picture, then you'll find that the demand is all these countries will try to uh, attract investment. And in that, as part of that, part and parcel of that, if there is some engineering services to be provided, you can be darn sure that you get paid in US dollars. And it's, the choice is yours. If they say no, they will not, then you don't have to. Yeah. But uh, increasingly, uh, money is being made available for that. One more question before we can go. Yes, sir. I want to ask Mr. Witcher, do you, uh, is all tax frame manufactured in Amarillo, and do you ship on board ship to Asia or air, uh, air ship, whatever? Yes, to both questions. Everything is manufactured in Amarillo, uh, and we do ship both air and ocean cargo. Right, most of it goes Well, uh, before we conclude, uh, let me make a few comments. These emerging markets are now re-emerging. They will stay. All these massive amount of uh, billions of dollars of investment, Dr. Gasper talked about 500 billion, you will see in the next 10 years. But before we conclude, uh, we do, Dr. Gasper brought some literature on Texas A&M's uh, PhD program in international business and, and uh, uh, management. Uh, if you are, uh, you know, interested, it's over there. And we also have, in our university, West Texas a and we have International Business Concentration Program, and I have some literature on it. Uh, overall, uh, the analysis we had, some excellent comments were made, wonderful discussion, it's a very timely area. And one thing which I would like to uh, say, and that is the globalization of finance, the globalization of technology, the globalization of human resources. And that's what's happening all over the world. It's a good sign for this uh, region and for this country and other countries. Overall, I think uh, it came out to be an excellent uh, seminar on behalf of uh, West Texas a and I would like to thank our speakers for their excellent time. And uh, one more thing, Dr. Gasper, he especially came from College Station. I asked him when I was going to bring him to a uh, canyon. I asked him what time he woke up. He said that he started at 5.30. So he came today for us. Uh, let's give a good hand. Give a very good hand. <laughs> Dr. Mayor, do you have any comments before we conclude? Well, thank you very much. And uh, goodbye, and we'll see you next time.